Uh, sir, on that Samsung A515U, you want to speak up for me? Talking to me? Yes. Yep. You. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. Yep. You got to watch your mouth. Oh. You understand me? Yes. I, I haven't said anything. You're not, you're not starting out very well with me. What's your name? Uh, Francis Noir. Noir? Noir. Can talk bad about me as much as you want outside here, not in the courtroom, though. Do you understand? I'm, so I'm sorry, I didn't realize okay. I was. Yeah, on the phone. I, yeah. Watch your mouth and keep your shirt on. I'm gonna send you back. Talk to one of the attorneys. Just stay right there for me. Okay. Welcome back to Time Serve, the channel that scans the docket so you don't have to. Today was crazy, and unlike every other court channel, I won't be showing what happened in Judge DeSantos because on this channel, we do the work and find the cases that you haven't seen. With this being said, I found judges catching liars, users, and abusers all day in court. There's a shifty meth user and a child abuser in Judge Boyd, someone stumbling into Judge West's courtroom. Judge Shackelford must reinforce some simple court etiquette for some defendants. And I also have some interesting cases out of Georgia and Judge Stevens to round out today's daily docket. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe, set your notifications to all, and never miss clips not seen anywhere else. I'm your boy, Phil. Court is now in session. Let's roll, nerds. A nine o'clock settlement conference victim, again, does not appear to any other court proceeding. Is that the address on McGuire? You're living there? Yes. Okay, so is Miss McCall in that house? That's her mailing address, but she don't stay there no more. Mr. Shah's had any contact with her of any kind? You said what? It just, I'm just looking because. No, the only contact I had. I no, don't, no more saying, uh -huh. don't talk. You don't want to say anything to me. Um, Mr. Kaziki, my only concern is the notice that we sent out to her was at that address. So we're sending her notice to an address that she's definitely not getting because we know she's not at that house. Um, so I just was curious if Mr. Um, I, I think that she would. I'm kind of uh, surprised if she was serious about this. She didn't contact the court or the police to tell them what a mailing address would be. Well, I mean, the victim's advocate might have information that we don't have. I don't know. All I know is the only information I have on her or that we have is the address that the court sent notice to and the court sent notice to his address oh. and she doesn't live there yeah, have you been living at that address yes okay. so you know and if he's not having contact with her I, I think it's fair to assume she's not getting her mail uh i don't think we have an advocate in the building so no way of checking with him Yeah, I'm not inclined to dismiss it just because of that. I don't have anything indicating that she received notice because the only address we have. I think there's been a while. Yeah, no mail return, but that doesn't mean anything. Well, if it's come yeah, going to his right, house. Yeah. So I'm going to set for a settlement conference. Complaining witness. We're going to do this one more time. Um, uh, I'm saying it can appear via Zoom. Um, and I'm going to just make a note, uh, advocate. She don't talk. She don't record everything. I know.
All right. So we'll get you a notice in the mail of the new date. I am going to allow you to appear via Zoom. All right. But I want to be real clear to you, Mr. Kowalczyk, because my court officers let me know that you were very impatient today. It is 9.39. I was. I was. I'm talking. talking. It's my turn. Judge talk. It's, it's, your hearing was set for 9 a.m. Um, there are courts. I used to be a trial attorney for years and years. I could sit in court from eight to two waiting for my case to be called. We're very prompt here. And this building does not revolve around your needs or your desires. We call cases in the order that they come to me. I don't play it's favorites. Mr. Gazicki's house counsel, he's got lots of people to talk to. And, and there is not, you do not have a gold star on your chest that puts you above everyone else that walks in this building. He takes them in by the order that he receives them. So I'm allowing you to appear by Zoom um, for your convenience, but this court is not here to accommodate you. We do everything we can, right? To try and get people in and out. Yes, but I have an expectation that you're going to be respectful to my staff and you're going to be patient like everybody else here. Okay? Yes, You'll get notice in the mail. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is there any way I can say something? I would talk. Um, sir, you have a right to remain silent. I'd rather you talk to your lawyer. I don't want you to say anything about me. There's a court down there. I want to do about my vehicle and my dog. Dad, no. this court doesn't have jurisdiction over that. You're going to have to, like I told you, go file the police report. Good. Are you Ricky Johnson? Yes, ma'am. You all right? Yes, ma'am. So, Mr. Johnson, yes, before we go forward, I'm going to um, have you have a seat in the jury box and have you tested, see if anything's in your system. Have a seat up. few moments later one eternity later mr johnson he tested positive for thc <clears throat> methamphetamines and amphetamines that's obviously a violation of your bond um and so i'm going to raise your bond at this time uh, to one hundred thousand dollars a condition of that bond if you make it is to wear a drug patch at all times you can go back with the bail <laughs> Um, he's, let me see. Seven charges, is that correct? Oh, that's correct, Judge. Okay. All right, we are still live on YouTube. This is the State of Judges versus Samara, Samara Norris. Um, charge and warrant number 2023 WA12454, possession of a firearm during a crime. 2023 WA12455, participation in criminal gang activity. 2023 WA12456, aggravated battery. 2023 WA12457, aggravated assault. And 2023 WA12458, kidnapping. 2023 WA12459 armed robbery. 2023 WA12460 conspiracy to commit a crime. <clears throat> the defendant is represented by Mr. Javarik Rogers, and um, the state is represented by Ms. Freeman. Ms. Freeman, your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Investigator Burrell, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you swear and affirm that the testimony about to provide in the matter of Samara Norris will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Yes, ma'am. All right, you can tell us your name and, and how you're employed. Uh, my name is Investigator Madison Burrell. I'm employed with the Morrow Police Department in the state of Georgia in Clayton County. How long have you worked with the city of Morrow Police Department? Um, I've worked for the city of Morrow a little over a year with a three-year brief period to go to the sheriff's office. Can you explain that last part? 
Uh, I just went to the sheriff's office briefly for uh, approximately three months, but overall I've been almost employed with the city of Mar for a year. Okay. Do you have any previous law enforcement experience? Yes, ma'am. And where was that? Uh, the city of East Point. How long were you with the city of East Point? Uh, two years, um, then the city of Lovejoy, and then I went to Morrow. Okay. Investigator, were you working with the city of Morrow Police Department on July 17th of 2023? Yes, ma'am. And on that particular day, were you with a group of officers who were dispatched to the Morrow Center located 1180 South Lake Circle? Yes, ma'am. Why did you respond to that location? Uh, we got a report of a person shot. When you arrived at that location, what did you find? Uh, I found the victim suffering from three gunshot wounds. Um, he was frantic and bleeding all over the place in front of the um, Morrow Center. Is the victim Derek Daniels? Yes, ma'am, it is. Did you call for emergency? Assistance for him? Uh, yes, ma'am. They were um, already there. Um, well, they were already there. They showed up a short time after we arrived. Were you able to speak to Mr. Daniels to find out what happened? Uh, yes, ma'am. While on scene, um, he stated that he had gotten robbed and um, didn't provide much info until we had got to the hospital. Was he transported to Grady? Yes, ma'am, he was. Were you able to interview Mr. Daniels at Grady? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, along with Detective Tate, uh, we both interviewed him. He he wanted to say that um, he didn't know the people who had shot him, um, but he ended up showing us an Instagram profile of the female who he stated had been one of the people that had shot him. Um, I believe it was Dior 2K um, with some characters somewhere in there um the profile didn't have any photos on it but um we ended up getting an exigent ping for his phone because he stated his phone was taken from him and um we pinged that phone to the area where we found um miss norris after contacting her mom after so we looked on flock we found the vehicle um that he had explained we found the register owner we contacted who is um, miss norris's parents um, and based off of that, she told us that Ms. Norris was inside room 119 at the Quality Inn in Fayetteville, Georgia. Um, and then when we went to the Fayetteville uh, Quality Inn, I had um, read Ms. Norris, her Miranda rights, asked her where the phone was, considering it was pinging right in the area where she was. And she took it out of her back pocket and handed it to me. Was that the phone that belonged to Mr. Daniels? It was. This was the phone that was taken during the... Um, robbery? It was. When you located Miss Norris, did she provide any statements about what happened? Not right away. Um, she was kind of general with her statements, but um, once we took her to the Fayetteville Police Department to be questioned, she did tell us, I would say, about 90% of the story what had happened. Yes, ma'am. And what did, if you could, if you can recall, what did Miss Norris tell you what happened? Um, so to summarize it, basically, Miss Norris had a significant other at the time, his, he, who she identified as DJ, who ended up being Mr. DeNorris Lee, who also, uh, as of right now, has outstanding warrants for this incident. Um, she stated that Mr. Lee had wanted her to lure um, Derek to the mall. Um, Miss Norris Instagram, I, I don't remember if it's Instagram or text message, asked Mr. Daniels to meet her at the mall. Mr. Daniels met her at the mall. They went to the vehicle, which was a silver Ford Escape. Um, once they got to the vehicle, Miss Norris texted her boyfriend that Mr. Daniels was armed with a purple and black firearm. Um, once he got to the car with Miss Norris, um, that's when Mr. Um, Denoris Lee and another unidentified male held Mr. Daniels at gunpoint. Um, Mr. Norris, I mean, Mr. Lee had a rifle. Um, they took the firearm off of Mr. Daniels. They handed it to Miss Norris. Miss um, Norris was instructed to get into the back seat with Mr. Daniels. Um, she held him at gunpoint along with the passenger who was, who was identified, unidentified at this point. And Mr. Lee drove them to the BP off of Jonesboro Road. 
um, in order to take his credit card information and put gas in the vehicle. Um, once they put gas in the vehicle, they drove back to the South Lake Mall where Mr. Lee attempted to exit the vehicle and all three of the occupants of the vehicle fired what we know is only 15 um, shell casings were found. So approximately at least 15 rounds were fired at Mr. Um, Daniels and um, they drove away. And that's where kind of the other part comes in where we show up and everything else. When you located Ms. Norris, did you locate any of the firearms? I did not. Was the vehicle that was taken from Mr. Daniels located? The vehicle was not taken from Mr. Daniels. The vehicle was um, Ms. Norris's mother and father's vehicle. And her mother had, once she got back, she dropped it back off the quality in because I that guess her mother first. was pressuring her into getting the vehicle back. Um, her mother went to work in the vehicle. Investigator Burrell, from your, uh, from your investigation in this case, were you able to determine whether or not Ms. Norris was in a game? Um, so the messages that she was sending back and forth to her boyfriend um, suggested that she was either in the gang that he was in, which is um, kind of a spinoff of the blood gang, um, or she wished to be part of it. Um, at some point, I guess it was brought up that it might have been an, an initiation into the gang. Um, she did, doesn't use the letter C as, you know, most blood members do in her messages to her boyfriend and stuff like that. Um, that was one of the charges that was, um, my major, I guess he had called the DA and she suggested that was put on based off of the uh, information provided. The messages that you were indicating that you reviewed, uh, were these placed into evidence? Um, Miss Norris's phone was placed into evidence with the messages. However, she did provide the passcode to her phone, um, and for us to read the messages between her and her boyfriend. You stated that Mr. Daniel sustained several gunshot, um, wounds. Were you able to... Um, find out what his injuries were yes ma'am um he got shot once in the right shoulder i want to say um he got shot once in the pelvis um which was the most the one that injured him the most because he had to uh, get surgery i believe for that one and then he got um hit in the shin as well Have you been able to follow up with Mr. Daniels to determine, um, I guess, how his recovery has been? Um, no, ma'am. So the last we talked to Mr. Daniels, he was still in the hospital. Um, that was a few days after the incident. Um, another detective at the police department is supposed to be following up with him to have him come in and answer further questions about the incident. Was Mr. Daniels forced to get in the back of the car? Yes, ma'am. Did all of this happen in Clayton County? Yes, ma'am, it did. of the text messages um and the fact that uh, we did show miss norris uh photos she did identify um uh, mr lee as her boyfriend um as well as mr daniels as the victim was there any surveillance or any kind of video footage that capture any of this there's no, I mean, I guess I'll say there's no good video footage. Um, the Morrow Center, right where that, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the South Lake Mall, but right where he did actually get shot, the actual incident location, 
um, is an abandoned Sears. So there's no store there. Um, so there's no real good video footage of the incident occurring. Okay. Were there any other witnesses that you were able to speak to that may have no. seen anything? No, ma'am. It was a very secluded part of the mall. You, it's a essentially an empty parking lot where nobody really uh, was around. Thank you. That's all I have. Yes, ma'am. All right. Go ahead and cross examination. Thank you, uh, Investigator Burrell. Just a couple of things. Number one, are you uh, the lead officer on this case? That's a, um, so the initial report was taken by the sergeant and um, I, along with Detective Tate, went to investigate it further, if that makes sense. So um, the lead officer was the original responding officer um, who I was actually with just because I knew the information firsthand when I had showed up. I had gone along with the other detective to do more of the case. So essentially the sergeant who took the initial report would be, I guess, by rank would be the lead officer. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but he's technically a primary officer. Um, if you look at it like that, yes. Okay. Well, let me ask you like this. Who, who's actually working the case, I guess? Uh, Detective Tate and I. Um, and I know Ms. Ms. Freeman just asked you about video. So I guess I just want to make sure I'm clear. I know you said it wasn't good. Are you saying that there is video, but it's just... It doesn't depict anything relevant or yeah there's a couple places that um have video but you can't see any uh, anything from the video um it's too far away because it's you're depending on businesses that are across that big parking lot so there's no um there's no real video macy's um in front of the macy's and then they brought him to the bp and then they brought him back to the mall and that's where um, they brought him to the secluded parking lot and he tried to exit the vehicle Okay, so it started at the so they they did not the whole incident didn't start there. That's just where the incident started at the Macy's in the mall. They um, once they got him in the car, held him at gunpoint to the BP off Jonesboro Road, and then brought him back to the mall. Um, that's when he tried to exit the vehicle, and that's when they shot at him. Yes, sir. And as you understand, it, not counting Mr. Daniels, there are three people involved. Is that correct? Yes, sir. From my understanding. But at this point, you only know two people of two of those three. Yes, sir. Um, we're waiting on um, Mr. Lee to um, get arrested to try to take his cell phone and do records on his cell phone as well and dump his cell phone. And so, well, let me ask you this, uh, based on, on that response, is it safe to say that, at least as far as you know, Ms. Norris hasn't had any contact with that person? Which one? The unidentified person. Oh, no, um, that's Mr. Lee's friend. She told me that was his friend and she didn't know who he was, and that was her first time meeting him. And do you know, well, I guess let me ask this at this point. Do you know, was there ever any discussion about why Ms. Norris would be participating in this, in these alleged events? Um, just the fact that it's her boyfriend. Um, there was messages between them uh, talking about stealing cars together. I guess she just wants to participate in his um, extracurricular activities um, as his girlfriend. That's really all I could gather from her uh, messages between him and her. Do you know anything about their age differences? Like are they the same age or anything? They're around the same age, yeah. Well, you haven't you haven't seen or heard any kind of recording of that? No, I have not. 
but it does line up um, with Mr. Daniel's testimony as well, because he did say that she had shot at him as well. All three of them had shot at him. John, I would say that the, the gang charge is at, the, at best premature. Uh, and in any event, I would say it's unsupported by probable cause, and I would ask the court to dismiss accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, of course, we're asking all the charges abound over. And regarding the gang charge, um, Judge Investigator Burrell testified that um, basically her supervisors, with their um, knowledge and experience, as well as the um, the advice from the district attorney's office, um, indicated that considering um, the information they received from reviewing the messages um, by uh, Ms. Norris regarding her boyfriend that um, she put the charge on for participation in criminal gang activity. So we're asking that that charge along with the others are bound over to Superior Court. All right. Based upon the evidence presented here today, um, I will not find, I do not find sufficient probable cause to bind over the participation in criminal gang activity. However, I am I do find sufficient probable cause to bind over all the other charges. That's the order of the court. Thank you, Judge. Is that you, Larry? Come on. Up. All right. The defendant is present with Mr. Wilkerson, his attorney, and the state's attorney. Earlier, the defendant pleaded guilty to failing to comply with sex offender registration requirements, a second degree felony. A pre sentence report has been prepared. Have the parties had an opportunity to review it? Any corrections or changes to it? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Nothing from the state. Then it's made a part of the record for all purposes. Thank you. The agreement is whatever sentence shall not exceed a cap of four years in prison. So it's a second degree felony. So we're looking at no less than two, no more than four years confined. I guess a deferred or unadjudicated probation is an option is an for the up to yes. 10 years. And uh, Regular probation. Yes, sir. Uh, so he can be sentenced no less than two, no more than four years confinement and then suspended and placed on regular probation. Yes, so up to 10 years. So those are our options. Go ahead, Mr. Wilkerson. Well, Your Honor, I think the most important thing to know about this. Well, how much time has he got, too? I guess that's an for us to know. Huh? You've been in jail a while? Oh, about 17 months, sir. Well, he's selling to get out, really. Pretty much. Okay. If, if he's sentenced to four years, right? If it's in half, it's going to be a quarter. It's true. Yes. For all of them, a quarter, which is in one year. Okay. Go ahead. So, Your Honor, I think the most important thing to note about this case um, is that Mr. Johnson was transient at the time of this incident. Um, he had just gone past his birthday uh, registration deadline uh, by a couple of days. Um, he had, obviously, there was one driver's license address that did not match the address he was registered at. He advised his... <coughs> He advised his uh, 500 days, well, 495. Yes, he, he advised his registration officer um, of an address that he was attempting to acquire at the time. Um, the officer called the complex and he had not submitted uh, a lease at that time. I believe he was uh, residing with someone in that complex and was attempting to secure a lease to those premises. Um, but, Your Honor, again, um, Mr. Johnson was essentially transient, um, sleeping from place to place where he could find shelter for the time being, including up to and including uh, a house that had burnt down and was abandoned across from the uh, car wash that where the address had been registered. Um, that gentleman confirmed that he had been receiving mail there. I believe he was allowed to use that address as registration previously um, based on an agreement with that gentleman who owned the car wash. Um, and so, Your Honor, in this case, 
uh, I think that while the offense is serious, uh, unquestionably, uh, and we want to know where people who have committed uh, sex offenses are located, the whole purpose of the registration requirements. I think in this particular case, the court has to look at the fact that Mr. Johnson was transient at the time of this incident. Let, let me, okay. I just, just a food for thought. That's not a defense. And yeah. a transient is the most, it, it makes the whole rules of, of uh, reporting requirement, which are necessary for us to know at all times where you are, that makes him really anonymous now. It, it's, and so transient status, I, 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 I know people sometimes are in that status, but we, the, the people have a right to know where offenders are at all times. And just because you're transient is not, uh, that's the most vulnerable. Those are the hardest to find and locate. And that, that is still the onus and the obligation is on the defendant, even as a transient. It, but being a transient, you lose, we lose track. It, it, indeed, it is okay. on him, Your Honor, and it's not a defense, which is why he's pled guilty to this I, offense. I know, but being a transient is is <clears throat> makes him the hardest to find and locate when we, the people, have stated they want to know where sex offenders are at all times. I would, okay. Judge, I just do want to note, too, that the, the law contemplates... Um, registered sex offenders being transient in a way that doesn't for any other law. There are special rules for being transient under chapter 62 that could apply to him to take that into consideration. Um, had he been keeping up with his reporting requirements, which he's been required to do since 1978. I mean, these are not, this is not something new to him. That's when he received his conviction for indecency with a child. Um, he should be well familiar with, with the rules. That's what his I'm history shows. Oh, the offense date, I'm sorry, was 1978. You're right. He was convicted in 87. The offense date was 78. Um, I, either way, <laughs> I mean, 30 years of, of yes, plus of reporting. Uh, that's 36 right. years. So, uh, th I mean, there are rules within Chapter 62 that do apply to registered sex offenders um, that take all this into account, um, even though it's not a defense their requirements can be different. He pleaded guilty in 2015. <clears throat> it says failing to comply with sex offender registration filed in 14, but he pleaded guilty. It says to a lesser. To offense. attempted. It was an attempted failure. Yes, sir. That's okay. what he pled to was attempted okay. failure That's and then got 180 days state jail for that. And I'm sorry, 180 days county jail under 1245. Right. Right. I guess there is a way of attempting to fail. Huh? <laughs> well, uh, right I just, since 1980. I'd, I'd, like I'd like one day when we don't have anything else to do to to just use our open our minds and try to figure out how that is humanly possible. But nonetheless, it's what it is. It's that's for that's a subject for another time. But but go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Wilkerson. Well, I was I was just going to note, Judge, registering since 1987. Uh, it, obviously, he's had uh, other offenses between those times, Your Honor, and times that he was incarcerated. Um, but he has kept up with his reporting requirements for a vast span of years. When it, when it comes to, but that's fine. I know what you the point that you're making is. So he stumbled a little bit. But in this type of offense, stumbling the, the people, the lawmakers, and the courts don't want a glitch in the in when you have a sex offender who is required to be whose whereabouts are supposed to be known at all times, and then there's a gap. Anybody feel safe? No, and that's problem, and that's why. There are gaps in doing the job that you're required to do are not excuses. You have to figure them out. And a tr being a transient is the worst. Now we don't know where he is. So 
I mean, you, you somebody want to go on television and go, there's a sex offender somewhere in the town. We don't know where he is. Good luck, everybody. He's, he's not recording, and he's, and he's not. We don't even know where because he's a transient. Well, the people are going to say, wait a second, this, this law is not working. Because we're supposed to be able to know where the persons are in this situation at all times. And it's their obligation, your obligation, even as a transient. But a transient, I mean, a transient has no place of, uh, of home, of residence. And, and you know, it, it's it, foremost is transient or not. He has to be known where he is. And he has to report. But transient, he's most likely to be unfindable. And that's a even a greater problem. I, I will note to his credit, he has maintained the same line, the same phone number, same line of communication, so that he could be reached at any time by his registration officer. Uh, I'll note that to his credit, Your Honor, so that he, he could be located in, in some manner. He did fail to register. He did plead guilty to this offense. I know the court would probably be loath to consider it, but in this particular instance, perhaps deferred is, a, is an option because it would follow the agreement. And if he did violate, then the agreement has been followed. So the court would be then allowed to sentence him anywhere within the range of punishment um, for this offense, anywhere up to 20 years, if he were to violate probation. I think that uh, he would admit that perhaps uh, drug use. Uh, compounded the problems and was an issue with regard to this and therefore perhaps some, are you helping him now perhaps some treatment would would help him um ensure that he could meet the requirements that he's subject to at this time judge what's the judge we're going to ask for the court to sentence the defendant to four years in tdc what would you like to say sir thank you your honor your honor uh, i know i he did mess up, and uh, I'm actually going to be lenient, but Ron, I talk with Ms. Banks, and she says there's a special needs program. Who do you talk to now? Ms. Banks. Uh, Banks. Yes, she said there's a special needs program that I could qualify for, because even if I did go to prison, get out, I will still be uh, be homeless. But with this program, she said that they could get me uh, housing, get me get housing, that way I won't, you know, I can be located at, at all times. But right now, if I go to prison, Your Honor, I'm get out. I'm be, it's don't have, I don't have the same problem. But with the help of Ms. Banks right. and uh, the uh, probation, why can't, they're going to do that. Why can't you get help? Well, well now the age where probation. Well, I mean, there are. Well, with, 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 uh, probation, with, with probation, now I'm, I'm, I'm of age where I can get into a senior yeah. citizen's place. And that's what Ms. Banks said there would help me with, with the special needs program that they have. I believe he's stating it's a program through the probation department specifically, Judge. What states respond to that? I mean, Judge, it, it, everything that the defense is saying is putting the responsibility for the defendant's registration on other people, on the Port Arthur Police Department, that he had his phone number so that you know, Detective Hebert could contact him at any time when that's not Detective Hebert's responsibility. It's the defendant's. I mean, it's nobody else's responsibility to take care of these things, but but the defendant. So that that's my concern is there. There's no responsibility for the defendant here. Okay. We sentence him to four years, and then he gets credit, and he's out. So. Um, because he's got 495 days, and it seems like you know, logically he would probably be released based upon the time served. What methods are available if that was done? What options are available in the community for this defendant to go to and follow up on his requests? without it being a probation order that is already there for him. What do we do? Judge, I'm, I'm, I don't really have the answer to that. If he's sentenced and released on parole, uh, 
parole would have resources to be yeah, able to help that's, him. That's true. But, but uh, that, was, that is true. They, so he would be on a parole, uh, and, and the, the, pe the parole people here, I understand, are pretty good about helping folks as though they were on a term of probation. So that that is where... Uh, if that's what the court is, if, if that's the avenue the court takes of sentencing you to flat time under this agreement, and then you are released, but you're under parole, obviously, you it's like probation in that there are going to be parole uh, conditions, and that's what you uh, need to convey to them if they don't otherwise know that you need some, you're asking for some help to get your obligations accomplished. And I don't see why these other programs that you're asking for cannot be applied as a parole condition. <laughs> because if you fail on parole, I, you know, that's... Uh, I would note to the court that um, the court would have a longer period of supervision if the court were to place him on probation um, than if he were paroled out. Well, and here's, here's in response to you, if you're trying to look at what ramifications uh, are, if you're trying to say, well, there's uh, more of a hammer over his head because um, I can sentence up to 20 years in prison for a deferred or unadjudicated probation violation. Yes. <clears throat> another by if he committed another felony, he's looking at official felon status, isn't he? Or close to it. Uh, is he not? Should be. Um, he's got several state jails, he's got ag robbing and decency, yes, your honor, he would be looking, uh, and the failure to register, he would be, if it were. This would be his second TDC. So, so, it, yes. it, so this is a... Uh, but it depends on the this type is a second of degree offense. felony. It could be it would be enhanced to a first, the next one could be enhanced to a first degree felony punishment, which is deterrence enough. You're looking at life imprisonment if you get another one. So that to me is a motivator to get the job done. And I think the parole people can help. Them. All right, if nothing further, I'm going to find here, Mr. Johnson, you pleaded guilty voluntarily. You were mentally confident to do so. You understand the consequences of pleading guilty. There's sufficient evidence supporting your guilty plea from, from uh, States Exhibit 1 admitted in your plea hearing to find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, I find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of this second degree felony of failing to comply with sex offender registration requirements. I am following this agreement. You were hereby sentenced to confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice uh, to serve a term of four years and uh, you will be given credit for all time you have served, which is unofficially at least 495 days. So uh, that should help you out on where you are on being subject to release on parole. But then those you must comply with the sex offense. Okay, sure. All right. Sure. All right. Rubio, Vanessa Rubio. And Mr. Sandoval, thank you so much for your patience. Court is calling 2023 CR4281A, State of Texas versus Vanessa Rubio. Can I have parties announced for the record for the state? For the state. Defense. Your Honor, good morning. Now, Frankie Sandoval on behalf of Ms. Rubio. Are you Ms. Rubio? Counsel, have you received all the discovery and did you reveal with your client? I have, Your Honor. Court will find that the state is in compliance with discovery. Ms. Rubio, I'm showing you what's entitled application for community supervision. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? And did you sign it? Yes, I did. Showing you what's entitled true bill of indictment. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Yes, I did. 
Council, it appears that the state is proceeding on the indictment as presented. Is that correct? It's my understanding, Judge. State, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Ruby, I'm showing you what's entitled court admonishments. Did you review that document with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it in all the appropriate places? Did you understand you're charged with the offense of theft of a firearm? That's a state jail felony. The range of punishment is anywhere from 180 days up to two years in the state jail facility and up to $10,000 fine. Did you understand? If you have a plea bargain agreement with the state, the court does not have to follow your plea bargain agreement. If for any reason the court does not follow your plea and gives you more than you bargained for, the fact that you entered a plea will not be used against you and you will be allowed to withdraw your plea. Did you understand? Yes. Did you understand you have a right to jury trial, a right for you or your attorney to cross-examine and confront any witnesses the state would call in the right to remain silent? Yes. Did you understand by entering this plea bargain agreement you were giving up those rights? Yes. Did you intend to give up those rights and enter into a plea in this case? Yes. Counsel, has your client been able to provide you with any defenses? She has, Do you believe she has a rational as well as a factual understanding of the charges against her? In my opinion, she does, Your Honor. Do you believe she's currently competent and was legally sane at the time of the offense? Yes, Judge. Miss Rubio, has anyone threatened you, coerced you, or placed you in fear to get you to enter this plea? No. Has anyone promised you anything other than the plea? Yes. Are you satisfied with the way you've been represented? Yes. Are you a U.S. citizen? Yes. Court will find that defendant has knowingly and voluntarily waived her right to jury trial. Showing you the plea bargain page. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Yes. According to the plea, punishment is to be assessed at two years in the state jail facility. State is not making any recommendations on your application for deferred. Is she applying for deferred? And your honor, for clarification, uh, after especially Ms. Rubio, uh, we would respectfully request uh, that um, we go forward on a regular community supervision. Your honor, she does not wish to apply for deferred. And in the interest of justice, uh, pending any TAP evaluations, if the court sees, uh, deems them fit, I would ask for sentencing today, Your Honor. All right. So the state recommends community supervision. They're taking consideration night mag number 716819, grand jury number 785613, JN number 2097716. There's to be restitution to Kyle Barney. K-Y-L-E-B-O-R-N-E. And you ought to agree that this crime was committed as a party with William Gordon and Nicholas Sarabia. Did you understand that to be the plea? Yes. Defense, is that the plea? It is, Your Honor. State, is that the plea? Yes, Your Honor. All right, state and defense, if you'll an issue where the defendant has decided to proceed for regular probation... Next, I'm going to show you what's entitled a waiver of appeal paragraph. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it in both places? Yes. Did you understand by signing that you're waiving your right to appeal? The only items that can be appealed are written pretrial motions that have been filed, heard, and ruled upon by the court. Did you understand? Yes. Counsel, are there any such motions? There have not been, Your Honor. Outside the agreement, the state is recommending that your community supervision be for a term of three years. There be a top evaluation and 200 hours community service restitution. Did you understand those are recommendations from the state and the court does not have to follow those recommendations? Yes. Then to the offense as charged, how do you plead? Guilty, not guilty, or no contest? No contest. State any evidence? State offers states exhibit one and all of her suggestions. No objection, Judge. Showing you what's entitled wavering consent to stipulation of testimony and stipulations. Did you review those documents with your attorney? Did you understand it? Did you sign it in all the appropriate places? Yes. Off the record, uh, Norma, we'll need the interpreter back. Back on the record. Again, did you understand you have a right to jury trial, a right for you or your attorney to cross-examine and confront any witnesses the state would call in the right to remain silent? Yes. Did you understand that today the state would be presenting evidence in the form of witnesses' statements and police reports, but most importantly, there'll be no live testimony. Did you understand? Yes. All right. And states, you may be excused to continue to confer. Court will find that defendant has knowingly and voluntarily waived and consented to stipulation of testimony and stipulations. Court will accept into evidence states exhibits one and attachments and review the same.
All right. After reviewing state's exhibits one and attachments, the court will find there's sufficient evidence to find you guilty, and the court will find you guilty. Are you proceeding with sentencing? In the interest of justice, that would be our request, Your Honor. Anything you wish to say on behalf of your client? Uh, Your Honor, I, I stand here with Ms. Rubio. Um, as the court is aware, we had a minor issue with respect to her bond. Uh, in order for judicial efficiency and to get on with her life and begin the process of putting this behind her, um, she sought my uh, direction at attempting to resolve all matters. Um, and that's what she wanted to do today as to um, accept responsibility, come forward and start the process of putting this behind her um, with whatever conditions the court deems appropriate, given the totality of the circumstances and the information the court learned today. All right. Are you employed? No. How do you support yourself? Um, currently, I am not. Since I went to jail for this, I lost my job, so I'm still looking for a new one. So when's the last time you were employed? Um, the, the beginning of June. Well, the middle of June, I guess. Maybe about the middle of June. Do you have any children? Yes, two. What are their ages? Uh, she just turned 12 and 14. Who do they live with? Um, they reside with both me and their dad. Who is the father? Um, William Bloodworth is one of them. I'm sorry, who? William Bloodworth. He is the father of my daughter. Mm -hmm. And my son's father is not involved. He takes that place of that. So you're saying you're willing, living with William Bloodworth? <laughs> Yeah, but in this, it says that Nick Sarabia is your boyfriend. That's what it says in the police report. Okay. No, I mean, it's not okay. That's what it says in the police report. And so who is this other that person? That is my kid's, sorry, that is my kid's father. No, you you didn't mention Nick Sarabia as being the father of no, any. he's not the father of my kids. No, excuse me. I'm sorry. Can you tell me what she just said in regards to Nick Sarabia? I don't say anything on this. Yes, please. Yeah, but in this, it says that Nick Sarabia is your boyfriend. That's what it says in the police report. She said, okay, no, it's not okay. That is what it says in the police report. That's what it says in the police report. Mm -hmm. and she says, that is my kid's, sorry, my kid's father. No, and then I have cross thoughts. No, oh. I didn't mention that Nick Sarabia is being their father. All right, thank you. So you said that Nick Sarabia was the children's father, but you just told me that. I'm sorry, he is not the children's father. He was the boyfriend at the time. Um, he is locked up right now. We have not spoken. Mm -hmm. And then why were you dishonest with me about your drug test? I'm sorry, that was seven days ago. I didn't think that it was me. No, no, no. That is not, that should not be in your system from seven days ago. When's the last time you used and what are you using on a regular basis? Seven days ago. What are you using? There was meth on seven days ago. Now, listen to my question. What drugs are you using? Meth. How often are you using meth? Uh, last time I did it was six, seven days ago. Seven days. And what else are you using? Else. And what is the father, Mr. Bloodworth, what is he using? Uh, nothing. Oh, your brother? Nothing. I find that people. We don't. We don't live together. We both share custody of my kids. They live with me, and then they live with their dad. Okay, we she's a joint custody. Come out. You're being very dishonest and slippery with me because I asked you. My mind is a steel trap, but I wanted to the court reporter to read back because maybe my mind is failing. But I highly doubt that. You told me that. Your children, 
were living with you and their father. And you said the other father don't, he's not a part of anything. Now you're telling me, oh no, he doesn't live with me. It's on and off. You've been dishonest with me from the very beginning. You were dishonest when I asked you if you're going to be positive. You were dishonest about that. Then you were dishonest about Bloodworth. I don't even know if this is this person's real name or not. Then you were dishonest about Sarabia. At first, you, and later you said he was the father of your children. Now he's not the father of your children. You're just being dishonest all across the board with the court. And I don't appreciate it. And dishonesty has nothing to do with nerves. You heard my questions. My questions were very specific. Yes. All right. This is what the court is going to do. I'm going to find you guilty. I'm going to recall the warrant. I'm going to sentence you to two years in the state jail facility, suspended and probated for four years. There's to be no unsupervised contact with minors. Is CPS involved in your life? No. Well, I mean, why are you saying no? Like they should be. You're using meth and you're taking care of children. CPS should be involved in your life. So I'm going to want CPS compliance. If CPS is involved in her life, I don't know if they're, they are or not. She's been dishonest with the court. I'm going to want the UA hotline until further notice. Intensive parenting classes. I'm going to want field visits. Random. One time per month until further notice. Please check on the children. There's to be no contact with the person who she's saying may or may not be the child's father. There's to be no contact with Nicholas, Anthony, Sarabia. And that means if he's at the Bear County Jail and he calls you and you know it's coming from the jail because they're going to ask you if you'll accept the cl collect call, you need to hang up because otherwise I'm going to count that as contact. And it's easy to see if that's happening because they keep a record of every phone call from the jail. Do you understand? There's to be no contact with William Clark Gordon. There's to be regular reporting by Zoom or in person. Proof of employment within 30 days. There's to be no employment as a home health care provider or with minors. Taking consideration NIDMAC number 716819. And Brittany, if you could do the uh, rejection for me on that case. All right. All right. It's NIDMAC number 716819. Grand jury number 78. 5613, JN number 2097716, 200 hours of community service restitution. Those will not be waived. TAP evaluation. And once the TAP evaluation is complete, she's going to start with intensive outpatient treatment. And the court is noting for the record that she's agreed she was acting as a party. With William Gordon. And Nicholas. Sarabia. Uh, probation. Is there anything else she needs? Oh, and I'm sorry. There's to be restitution. If any, to Cal Bernie, K Y L E B O R N E. Is there anything else you need for the court to be successful? I'm sorry? I don't think so. Um, I think everything sounds like it's going to help. Okay. Going to show you what's entitled Trial Court Certification of Defendants' Rights to Appeal. Did you review that with your attorney? Did you understand it? And did you sign it? Because this is a plea bargain agreement, because I followed your plea bargaining agreement, and because you waive your right to appeal, you do not have the court's permission to appeal. Do you understand? Yes. 
because this is a felony conviction, you're not allowed to own or possess any weapons or ammunition. If you have a question over what a weapon or ammunition is, you'll need to speak to an attorney. Do you understand? All right, we can go off the record. Here's the thing. Your children are depending on you to raise them and they cannot be raised by you if you are using drugs. And the people that you bring into your children's lives should be people who are not using drugs. Do you understand? All right, good luck to you.